started. Welcome to the fifth and final episode in the series we are calling L&D's Pivot to Performance, in which Guy Wallace and myself, David James, speak with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focus practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organisations. Over the series, we've invited guests that we know have made the pivot and have achieved real results from doing so. We've invited our guests to share their stories, we've questioned them on their approaches and encouraged them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. And now we've invited them all back for a panel discussion today. But before we do that, let's start with our own introductions. Guy, would you like to kick us off? Thank you, David. Yes, my name is Guy Wallace. I am, uh, I've been in this business since 1979. I was one of the lucky ones, I think, in that I was oriented from day one on into the perform a performance orientation to training and development, what we now call learning and development. And I learned uh, from the methodologies as my uh, peers that uh, I worked with had learned from the late Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, Bob Mager, and Joe Harless. Those were my first initial uh, mentors, if you will, indirect, and then later on, some of them became my direct mentors. Um, but we're here to talk uh, with our guests and have them share their stories with you. Wonderful. Thanks, Guy. And so very briefly, I'm David James, uh, formerly Director of Learning Talent and Organizational Development for the Walt Disney Company. Uh, and uh, to make it sound like I've been around for a while, I'm going to tell you that I joined training and development uh, in the last century uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, during some sometime during the early stages of this century, uh, I realised it wasn't necessarily all about delivery training. It was about real results. Uh, needed to change my conversations and my practice as a result of that. But that's enough about us. Um, let's welcome back our guests: Miriam Neal, uh, Carl Binder, Timu Lilia, uh, Frederick Peterson, Herfindahl, and Judy Hale. Welcome back. Um, perhaps we should do some uh, some quick introductions, perhaps starting with you, Miriam. Oh, well, that's fine. Hello, uh, my name is Miriam. I, uh, my current role is in um, as a head of global learning design and learning sciences at Novartis. I really love the title of my role. Um, I want to make a disclaimer because I'm here today as myself and not representing my organization. Um, I have started my career in learning um, with really like a focus on how learning can support work. And it was only later, thanks to people like Guy, that I really took that whole performance lens uh, even uh, broader. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm happy to be here and listen to uh, all the great people on the panel here. Thanks, Miriam. And Carl? Sure. Uh, my name is Carl Binder, and I was... Uh... I was originally trained as a behavior scientist, actually. I was a student with B.F. Skinner at Harvard, and then I got involved in uh, education and instructional design work uh, in the 70s, and then discovered ISPI in the, in the early 80s, and that's probably about when I met Guy, and had many of the same mentors, um, and uh, especially Tom Gilbert had an enormous impact on my work. And so what I've tried to do for the last, how many years it is, 40 years, um, take performance improvement and make it accessible to people with plain language and simple models. And we currently, my, my company, we, we basically tr certify performance consultants as well as managers and leaders to do a, an accomplishment-based uh, coaching uh, process in their organizations. Wonderful. Thanks, Carl. And Timu? Yeah. Hi, guys. My name is Timo Lilja uh, from Stockholm, Sweden, uh, working as a learning lead or learning and performance business partner within our uh, Swedish sales organizations in, in Telia, uh, which is one of the, um, if, or one of the, it is the biggest and, and uh, oldest telco in, in Sweden uh, with a footprint uh, within the Nordics and the, and the Baltics then. Um, so yeah, happy to be here, just being associated with you great minds. So I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, so yeah. Wonderful, thanks Tavu. And uh, Frederick? Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, as, as Timo said, I'm also working on uh, in Telia, uh, and uh, my, my current role is uh, global head of learning, um, and uh, it, uh, it's pretty new for me actually. I, I've been working within 
uh, within learning uh, in, in Sweden for, for like past five years in Telia. And then I've been... Oops. ...around in learning for, for um, the year. And... Uh, Oh, we're just lo we're just losing your uh, your connection a little there uh, there, Frederick. Uh, we'll look forward to hearing uh, more from you uh, shortly. And uh, and finally, Judy, would you mind giving us a brief introduction, please? Yep. Hi, hi everyone. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I have been in this business. I started my company in '74. You can do the math, and um, been around for a long time. I before that, I was the dreaded speech teacher. So, yeah. but moving <laughs> forward. Um, I have used the, my ability to communicate complex subjects in simple ways, like what Guy is saying, how do we make this available? How do we make it accessible? How do we make it workable for people who may not have had the opportunity to have had studied in certain things or something like that? So my specialty, however, is in credentialing and certification. So I am known as someone <clears throat> in when you want to measure something that's difficult or awkward, and specifically, uh, how do we assess people's ability to perform? And I'm I'm known for being innovative in my in, in my assessment methodologies. But in that, it's all about did the assessment at all show any correlation with what they do on the job? Mm -hmm. We don't go to work uh, and answer multiple choice questions. That's all we do. We do other things. So how then does that assessment? Really, how well does it reflect what it is we're doing? What I'm encouraged about <clears throat> is new work about how to reach new populations. In the United States, we have 6.5 million people who have cognitive challenges. 3.5 of those are on the autism spectrum. We also have one in three here with the arrest records. And that doesn't mean you were convicted. So we have people whose education was interrupted and opportunity shut down to them. So how do we reach, well, by the way, if we were, to, I just saw the number, if we were just to put all the people with arrest records together, that would, they would represent the 18th largest country in the world. So in the United States, come here and go to prison. That's our new mandate. So what we have here is how do we, how do we work with these people to, to really make them productive? Because the, uh, the educational opportunities, normal, were, were not available to them. So I'm really encouraged about some new innovative things that are going on. That's all. I'm in Chicago. Okay, that's the other thing. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks, Judy. Uh, so, so uh, our format is going to be: is we've had some uh, some questions submitted by um, uh, previous attendees, uh, and uh, and I posted um, uh, the uh, to a, a post on LinkedIn asking for questions to uh, uh, to put to our panel. Uh, and so, Judy, we'll uh, we'll start with uh, with you. Uh, we had a question from Jill Shepherd, and Jill's question is: How does NND manage the tension between learning for personal? Uh, sorry, let me start again. Uh, learning for personal career advancement and management versus improving business performance, or do you not see attention as being present or relevant? What do you think, Judy? Well, first of all, there is attention, but part of our our job is to get out of that to raise it higher. I'm a big believer in the sales strategy. You start with yes, 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 yes. So when that comes in, what are we doing? The answer is you're both right. Because they are. They're both right. But the raise the issue is really about, I call it bench strength. How agile are we? Do we have the ability to respond, to move around? And, and you ask, do, you, do we want to be agile? Most people will say yes. Few will say no. So the, given that, now we've got at least a common, we want to be agile. And that means... We have to look at both career prof professional development and uh, performance improvement. Uh, Forbes just today came out with this new article, uh, new research, and the, the, this workforce is expecting to be able to grow and learn, and they're looking for balance in their life. So we have to be able, the answer is yes, we do all of it. And we are capable of doing that. I don't, that helps you a little bit, David. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Judy. Anybody else like to, to add anything uh, to this que uh, this question about this this tension uh, between uh, L and D uh, uh, providing personal career advancement solutions and in, uh, business improvement solutions? 
No, then we'll move on to uh, to the next question then. Uh, and it's and, and I, I paired this one uh, um, as the second one. Carl, if I can ask um, ask this one to you. Herr Driesen on LinkedIn asked, uh, I think the next pivot away from performance has started recently because of actual labour market conditions. Any hints uh, for this uh, in this panel discussion? And uh, and I, I prompted her for, uh, for a little bit uh, more information on this. And so bear with me a moment. He's, uh, he's provided uh, an in-depth uh, seconds to uh, to his initial question. He said, pivoting to performance is a rational approach focused on what is valuable for an organization first. In this tight labor market, employees want learning and development opportunities focused on their personal development first. These might not overlap. So in this tight labor market, I see a next pivot to learning and development as secondary labor condition focus on employees and their development wishes first. Um, I'm Carl, do you have any uh, uh, any insight or, or or challenge to that? Well, I think there's a whole there's several dimensions to it, and it actually to some extent uh, continues what Judy was saying, which is a couple of things. First of all, I don't think it's just about learning and development. I think you have to have an environment where managers, supervisors, leaders, everybody is focused on continuous development. And if it's just left to uh, training or learning and development department, it's probably not going to be engaging. And then the other piece that's probably more important these days, you know, at least in the US, we talk about the great resignation and, and organizations having a hard time keeping their people. Well, as you pointed out, one of the main reasons for that is people want to develop. Now, I'm not convinced that everybody always just wants to develop their personal capabilities. I think what they want to do is move forward. And so uh, getting better at your job, having a career path, having a supervisor or manager who raises issues about what do you care about? What, what would you like to do next? What projects should we get ready for, et cetera? I think it's, you know, the, 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 the phrase servant leadership has been around for a long time. And I think what the servant leader does is arranges conditions so that people will be both productive and engaged. And that has to do with, yes, personal development, but most people, unless they're in a job just for the money, <coughs> Uh, in which case it's probably not a good match, uh, want to move forward in whatever it is that they're doing. And so I'm not sure that you can, first of all, I'm not sure that you can separate. I think Judy's right about yes and yes. I don't think you can pull these things to apart, these things apart very well. But secondly, if you arrange the conditions in the organization, L&D can certainly lead, but it has to be driven through managers and coaches and supervisors who are helping to develop their people. So there's a lot more we could say about it, but that's one way to think about it. I think. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I'd love to open it up, Miriam. Would you? Would you? Like yeah, that? I, I, I just feel that in this type of questions, there always seems to be some kind of underlying assumptions that these are two different things. Mm -hmm. While I think in reality, and as Carl said, if the work is organized in a certain way, if the conversations are transparent around why there are certain needs and why there are certain expectations from people, then they're not necessarily two different things, right? Of course, you might have personal interests that you also want to develop, or you might have some career aspirations that are maybe outside of your current space and, and that you might want to do some, some I don't know, other type of education for, or that there might be a path towards it. But I think usually we're talking about people who just want to do really well in their job and kind of see where they can go here, there, mm -hmm. or there, have good conversations with their managers about that, understand why they why they are asked to do what, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I actually think it's usually quite simple, but we make it um, quite complicated sometimes, I think. If, yes, I can, if I can add a couple things, extending what you, you said, um, Miriam, which is, couple things. We have this model, the six boxes model, and we talk about different parts of it. And one aspect is motives and preferences. And one of the things that my former partner taught me was as a manager leader, it's really important to understand the motives and preferences, the things that our people care about on two levels. One is they should align with the purpose of the organization. We want to hire people that line up with that. And secondly, we want to be sure we understand what the people care about, because that might affect how we assign them jobs. It might affect what career path they want to take and so forth. And then the other piece about this is that we emphasize that when we work with, especially with managers and leaders, people need to feel connected up to the whole organization. And a lot of times people have their sort of noses deep in whatever their daily work is, 
But if their managers can say, you know what, if that little form that you fill out 400 times a day is accurate and timely, that might have an effect on regulatory compliance or customer satisfaction or whatever. And all of a sudden people say, oh, that's more important than I thought. And so connecting people up to the success of the organization, I think, is another way to align personal development and, you know, professional or business related development. Yeah, in a, in a recent uh, survey that we conducted on what employees themselves deemed the most effective uh, ways of learning at work, uh, and that, I mean, there's real emphasis on effective rather than what they prefer. Um, mm -hmm. One of the first questions we asked was, what, what was the primary reason that they wished to engage in learning at work? And three quarters said uh, that it was to do their job better and faster. And that's three quarters. That's overwhelmingly. And of course, it shouldn't come as any surprise. Mm -hmm. But this is and this is a bit of a personal frustration. So forgive me, because I'm I'm head of learning experience, right? And people always seem to think that you're just about courses. Well, to me, when you think about learning experiences, it's holistic, right? It should also be about how you design the work and how you design the support structures mm -hmm. in work. And I mean, the whole formal part is only one element. So I don't, I never understand why people struggle to see that it, it just as one holistic mm -hmm. thing judy mm -hmm. this comes back to the issue about informal learning lots of learning is serendipitous Most okay of it. You, you overhear a conversation you get to participate on a team you join a task force and in doing that you get new information new insights you observe people solving problems differently so there is that whole serendipitous mm -hmm. learning that happens then. Mm -hmm. So that's the organization. How does the organization reward, support, or enable people to have these non-structured serendipitous learning events? So mm -hmm. learning, it doesn't happen to be nine to you know ten on Fridays at two, you know, or it's not always in a box on a video screen or something like that. So we need to think of learning literally is is all that opportunity around us to hear new people, hear new ways of thinking, observe somebody, take a problem, do it differently, mm -hmm. whatever. That's the learning. Mm -hmm. So does the organization recognize that? Does it does it support that? That's really where the, I think that's where the real opportunity is. Yeah, that's a good point. Let me, I think, sorry, I want to add one more thing, which is um, a few years ago, there was an article in Harvard Business Review called HR Goes Agile. And we've I've leveraged that a lot in the last few years because what it said was the organization business things are moving really fast, and the LMS or the the formal learning that Judy was referring to is probably not going to keep up with it in most cases because our team's doing a new project and we need somebody to get up to speed on something or you're getting ready for the next job or whatever it is. And so what the argument was is we need to put in the hands of supervisors and managers as coaches the development of their people so that they can enable each individual to develop as they need to in real time. And that's where a lot of the informal learning comes in. It's like, why don't you spend the morning with Jack over there? Cause he knows how to do this or, or let's put you on a new project and I'll give you a lot of feedback. And so to me, we leverage that a lot because we have an accomplishment based coaching approach, which is very explicitly about let's talk about what the most important thing for you to get able to do and produce and let's help you do that. And when that becomes kind of quarterbacked or whatever word you want to use, coordinated by the manager or the supervisor, it's a much more, it's more agile to use that word. So I think that's an important piece. But I, that, yeah, that, I think one of the key points for me there is that you still need to provide some kind of structure to that, right? Because I Absolutely. think it's also often an assumption that if, if you go and send people to have a lot of discussions that then they're going to learn. That's not necessarily true either. So you need somehow to give some kind of semi-structure mm -hmm. around, you know, this is how we organize the work. This is how we make sure you get the right level of guidance so that you can actually learn. Mm -hmm. This is how we help managers to give good feedback and all that stuff. So it needs yes. to be all in that one system Absolutely. to I make wonder, it work. I wonder, I wonder what would happen is if we actually put in the supervisor's job description that their job is including is growing learning talent exactly. development coaching whatever fancy words you want so then if you actually set out expectations and rewarded your supervisors for saying yeah. oh you saw joe what what happened tell me mm -hmm. what insights did you get what are your takeaways oh 
you sat on that new committee. What did yep. you learn from that? How's can that relate? So your point is you you the structure that Miriam's talking about is that you purposely ask questions to people to get them to reflect. You set the frame that they're expected to learn, that learning is all around them. That that's really where the huge opportunity is, I think. Well, and you raise you raise a question that we raise a lot with managers and leaders, like what is the job of a leader or manager? Oh. It's not to be the smartest guy in the room. It's not to it's it's there's a lot of things that leaders and managers can do, but fundamentally they're about arranging conditions so their people will be productive and engaged. So that involves what you just described. But when you say that to some leaders or managers, it's like, huh? I didn't know that was part of my job, you know, which is stunning. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, let's move on to the uh, the next question. And uh, and as we do, I'd, I'd encourage that uh, the, uh, anybody joining us who has a question uh, that they'd like to add, please do add it in the uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, but I'd, um, I'd like to come to you, Miriam, because I think that this continues a, a theme here that we've been discussing already around uh, development for performance and development for uh, uh personal development, uh, this coming up in reskilling and upskilling, everybody's kind of got a vested interest in this. So another question from Jill Shepard, um, how does L&D address the challenge of reskilling and upskilling with a performance oriented approach? Yeah, I was wondering how it does it or how it should do it. So I'm gonna go for, the, for a second <laughs> more. <laughs> So I don't even really know where to start with this one, because to me, the whole, um, and I've talked about this before, is the whole new focus on skills, you know, from a learning side of thing is quite surprising to me. You know, I really don't understand what we have been doing all these years if it wasn't upskilling and reskilling. And uh, I actually read a, a quick article this morning about the history of instructional design, and it said, like, um, you know, it started all in around 1944, and then, you know, it was all focused on um, upskilling, reskilling, and knowledge acquisition, right? And it's been like that for years, and then it changed to more like focused on personal experience and human-centered is on la la la. So I was like, okay, so we were doing it back in 1944, and anyway, <laughs> so take a step back. So I think there's two elements to it. Upstream, I don't want to go too deep into that, but just what I mean by that is organizations need to find a way to identify the key skills, um, prioritize them, and, you know, making clear, like, which one are the most important. The second one is, I think they need to be really clear with what they actually mean when they say skills. And I, I think that this is a really interesting one, because what I saw, I, I was recently reading a report by McKinsey, um, they define skills like a whole lot of things, like capabilities, talent, mindset, like the whole shebang. And I was like, isn't this interesting? We create this bandwagon around skills, and then we realize, oh, we're actually not talking about skills. We're talking about something completely different. We're talking about all kinds of things. Yeah, didn't we already know that? So I don't, I don't really know where how that all happened. But so so let's say skills are all kinds of things that people need to do their jobs well. That's not the right definition, but let's say that that's it. Then prioritize. Then you need to think about, you know, you just go back to the regular learning side of things. OK, what does the skill look like in the context of the work? You know, things like mm -hmm. proper task analysis. Guy can tell you all about it. You know, things like user research and do observations in work to understand like what the actual work context looks like and, and what people need in, in reality to get to, you know, competent. And then you need to design good holistic learning experiences, what we talked about before. Could be for have formal pieces, could be, you know, design work in a certain way, could be uh, feedback structures or maybe, you know, uh, apprenticeship type thing uh i mean it's just about good design and then you need to measure if it has been impactful and close the gaps yeah i, see, I mean i'm not so, saying it's yeah, easy so, but it's out it's, it's the process is always the same so yeah yeah so yeah so so the key part to that is kick it off with some analysis to understand what it is that you're what's the current situation and what is it that you need to affect uh, which isn't which is not similar to um, 
buying platforms filled with content <laughs> with so much possible content that there must be something for everybody and then trying right. to create a culture of self-direction so that people find the stuff that doesn't relate to their job in this mass abundance of content you know it's a, you know there's you know that that's what we're being sold and there are smart ways of serving up content that doesn't relate to your job these days but it, but it starts with the analysis and you don't you won't close any gaps and you won't understand the gaps to be closed without that analysis have i uh, have, have mm -hmm. i got that right miriam mm -hmm. yeah there you know there's another piece to that also that i learned from joe harless and tom gilbert sort of which is if you focus on accomplishments or the products of behavior, then that pulls everything along, not just skills and knowledge, but also tools and feedback and all the rest of it. And it also connects you directly to the job. If you say somebody's mm -hmm. got to be able to produce a better hiring decision or a better widget or a better relationship, which are all things, the products of behavior, then you focus everything on that. And some of it is skills and knowledge, but a lot of it is other stuff too. But it pulls you into the job environment basically by That's doing right. that. That's why skills I, is I not necessarily no, no, right term, right? Sorry, uh, team chat. Like, yeah, no problem. I, I'm just, uh, uh, me and Frederick, we are the polite Swedes here. We don't say anything until someone asks us to. But I have a good, uh, easy example of this uh, with, with, regarding like this reskilling uh, thing, because we were involved in a project like we, we have consumer sales and then we have business to business sales. And we wanted to, to do this um, uh, internal movement more smooth like if you are uh, in a, a store sales rep the only chair you are looking at is the store leader chair and 10 people are looking at the same chair and everyone wants to go there so we had to uh, hr was like we have to uh, get this internal movement to the sides uh, more smooth and and the, um, um, we looked at what would be the role for example a, a store uh, sales rep uh, what would be a natural next step if it's not leadership then it would be like uh, uh, mm -hmm. small medium enterprise sales a little mm -hmm. bit more complex than what they are doing now so uh, they were like okay we need to skill them up reskill them or or whatever so what we did was we talked with talent acquisition and we talked to the recruiting uh, managers and when you are recruiting people people will come to interviews what what is the like the the things people need to know or the experiences that you want to see for them to be relevant to this job. And, and mm -hmm. when we map these things out, then we look back on the target group like, OK, mm -hmm. how do we create these experiences and how do, do we give them this knowledge and how do we get them uh, to get, uh, get the experience in Salesforce or whatever they ha haven't been doing now, but they are doing then. And then we just design it. So when they go through this this process, they are they are basically working in this new new uh, uh, mm -hmm. environment and that's the same thing with all of this you know this future skills like uh, big data analytics and and let's take some generic course and everyone needs to go it because someone probably will reskill but the interesting stuff is who is actually working with big data analytics and which part of the organization is actually doing it because it's it's not if no one is doing it, how the hell are we knowing what they need to know? So, so who are doing it? Are, are they able to actually recruit people there? How many people do they need? And when they try to recruit people, which is hard for uh, us big companies to, to get because they go to these flashy startups and stuff like that. So how do we give people the skills and the knowledge and the experience they need to actually do the work? I, I think it's pretty simple. Um, it's, it's always this, you know, black and white uh, stuff like well, now we have to focus on on personal development and not the the uh, performance on the job what would happen if we only gave people <laughs> personal development and nothing on the job you know it, it's it's not that black and white you have to do both and you, you yes yeah i don't know i get angry uh, as always so i mute myself <laughs> <now>. <laughs> so, so you're a passionate but polite swede so that's important <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 that's a good one no, that, that's right. Guy, you, you, you say this a lot. It, it's about um, uh, the context and helping people applying um, this, uh, you know, contextless um, uh, content does, doesn't take into consideration the complexity around its application, you know, and leaving the hard work to those who perhaps have the, the, the least experience in learning. What is it that, uh, that, that, you, that you share on that? 
Yeah. So I think it's, you know, too often we, we don't go that last mile. We provide people with generic experiences, generic knowledge and skills, and we don't address how to apply it in their performance context. So we mm-hmm. leave that last mile, so to speak, or kilometer to them to figure out. And that's problematic. And I think as Carl has spoken to this, and I think everybody here on the panel be- knows this and believes this, but well, we got to look at the performance, the outputs that are produced, uh, the accomplishments that are that are intended and back everything out from there. And yeah. and when we when we offer uh, suites of generic libraries of content, um, we leave people hanging. They can learn that they can master that content, but they may not master how to apply it in their jobs. Mm-hmm. And I think this is also so we can bookend that. We can explain to people, you know, why they should take the generic content. And then when they're done, taking it, we can we can uh, give the supervisors the ability and and the, what they need in order to see that they give feedback to Guy as he applies it, that they coach Guy through applying that generic content or have a peer do it. But but uh, I think they we're all on the same page here in terms of, you know, we need to address skills in context. And mm-hmm. if we don't uh, address them in context, we just leave people hanging and it won't transfer and it won't have a positive impact. It'll have a nil or negative impact. Uh, I sometimes feel that the the fact, you know, that it's become worse in the sense that we now use the term self-directed learning for that, right? And and it's in the end, it's lazy design because, but but what we expect people to do is we throw a bunch of content, you know, we might make it look nice and it's, you know, we might have some questions or maybe even some, you know, reflective exercises or whatever. Um, but then we say, okay, this is a self-directed learning experience. Off you go, you know, you, you do, you take what you need. You, you're a professional, you know, people don't know how to do this. We throw them into the deep end. And then if they fail, we say, Hey, come on, we gave you this experience and you're not performing and it's your fault now. So I actually think because we're using the term self-directed learning in the wrong way, because self-directed learning is not that right. Self-directed learning is, that's a different, uh, topic a different panel but it's 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 a it's something completely different so i think it makes it even harder for people to to manage yeah and then we blame line managers or we blame that people are, is not self leaders because of our bad design right so right. yeah totally agree it's it's the bad design is actually our failure to look at the context where they work mm-hmm. let's talk about simply speaking sales Sales is easy when your customer already loves you. But when you have a new competitor coming in or you have adver- uh, adversarial relationship with your customers or there, there's been a change. So we, we don't like look out at any of those things. For example, even if you come to work physically in a space, it's one thing. But if that space is not ventilated well, the lighting is poor. Mm-hmm. There's distracting noise, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Interruptions. Why do we think people can concentrate? Mm-hmm. Or or if you talk about access to information, well, I'm sorry, there's so much information. It's like getting the right information in a way that's usable and easable and act. So we don't do a good job, in my opinion, mm-hmm. of really looking at, at the context mm-hmm. where people actually do, and we make assumptions about what's in place, what isn't in place, and things like that. Even even labor relations. You, 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 you're training the supervisor, but it's an adversarial relationship in deference to everybody loves everybody, you know. And, and I, I think we need to be more diligent in our helping our clients and ourselves and our peers really to look at the whole context and not make be aware of our assumptions about it. That's all I have to say. You know, you know, there's another piece to this too, which is the way we're speaking about this sort of amongst colleagues in the L and D space. Um, this could sound like a philosophical conversation, but it's actually a bottom line return on investment conversation. Because if you throw all this generic content at people and then blame them because they don't do well, blah blah blah, you've wasted an enormous amount of resources for nothing. And so if we just focus on the things that people need to produce on the job, as you say, context, and let that guide everything, even if we don't do a very good job of it, that will probably increase the return on investment compared to the generic learning management system approach. You know? 
Yes. Mm. Yeah. So, so moving on to uh, to the next question, and uh, and Frederick, if I can uh, if I can um, uh, ask this to you, and Timo, please uh, chip in as well. Um, uh, do the panel have any experience of managing resistant stakeholders? Uh, so this could include bosses, uh, senior leadership, line managers, uh, perhaps employees themselves. Uh, these who are averse to trying a different approach, uh, and this different approach being uh, performance first. Yes, I, I never, I never managed to introduce myself, didn't I? Um, I had such a bad connection when when we started started off. Uh, it was maybe the best uh, introduction I, I, I ever made, but uh, you missed, you missed <laughs> out. Um, so tell us who you yeah. are, Frederick. Uh, I, 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 yes. Sorry? Tell us who you are. Introduce yourself, Frederick, before answering the question. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, I, I still have a pretty poor connection since I've, uh, I've uh, like located myself in a wardrobe upstairs. I used to work down in the in the um, uh, kitchen, but there, there's a war zone there right now since my kids are home. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working as the global head of learning at uh, Tilia, uh, so the same company as um, Timo, uh, and I guess he, he put our company in context uh, before. So I can start with, with answering the question. And like, since we have, a, have the privilege to work a lot with like uh, supporting sales and service organizations, they are very used to measure KPIs. And therefore, we haven't had that much problem, I said, to, to convince them in, into having a more like performance approach. Um, but um, like the, the stakeholders, they, they, um, they, I will say they get annoyed <laughs> because uh, we, we, they have like a legacy of expectation on, on us uh, that they, we just do whatever they tell us to do. So they, they can, for example, say that we, we're running this event in one week. Can you do a fun workshop? Um, and back in the days, we just go, yeah, yeah, we do that. Um, but when we start to ask him about uh, what, what, like, what's the performance outcomes and um, what, what should happen after this workshop, and, and then they suddenly need to start thinking. Uh, and while, while their thoughts has just, like, from the beginning, be, being like killing time, and get people to feel involved and maybe feel inspired. And, and I guess we mentioned that before, that like there's better people to be inspiring and funny. So therefore, they, we have to challenge that, them a little bit more. So that, that has been um, uh, pretty hard, I would say. Um, and, and they have not expected that from us. Uh, so the conclusion is, I would say, that the resistance has not been about what we do, maybe not what we not do. Uh, uh, so, so, um, yeah, to, to change, to change the, the focus to be more, more performance oriented. Um, mm. or, or what do you say, Timo? I can pass the word to you as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree on, on, um, on that, that, that the resistance with stakeholders is, is exactly, it, it's not what we do because they buy in on it. it. It's what we don't do anymore. That is the, the resistance, uh, then. But but and I, I totally agree with that and uh, um, I, I would say that if some if someone has been hard harder to convince maybe or, or took more time to convince it's line managers as as we talk about because um, they they were probably used to just sending people off to training and they don't have to worry about it people come back and they are like. Uh, educated uh, and uh, and they don't they, they don't need to do basically anything but if if uh, it, it, within our pivot uh, you know trying to improve performance back on the job then uh, something will need to happen in in, in the in the workflow uh, and for that to happen then the line managers will need to be involved giving feedback or or uh, you know, setting expectations or helping out with prioritations or or whatever. So they will need to be involved. And 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 uh, uh, it, it, when we come from you know the background we come from, where we are basically de delivering training and, and gathering people in 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 classrooms, um, it, it has led to line managers. You know, they, they have they, they do stuff all the time. They have a lot of stuff to do. So they're they. they the resistance is basically trying to squeeze in involvement so that they can 
help out in developing their people uh, with with the work they are trying to do but the, and, and the way we, we're trying to handle it is basically by involving them in in this analysis phase so they understand that this is a problem where we involve them in in the uh, design phase so they they are basically with us saying that here we could help this is what we should basically do and and maybe the more most successful thing we do is that we experiment and and um run pilots in small groups so we basically have in these pilots we have uh, people that want to try it out and then we uh, measure the impact of that and 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 do the evaluation and we create these kind of end reports and we say this is the value so after basically first time there is a resistance uh, second time a little less third time when they actually yeah, see true. what what is happening then they uh, is like um this is helping me to do my work as a leader uh, <laughs> also and 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 having impact on these kpis that i am me measured on so then suddenly that's not a problem anymore so I, I would say as frederick said stakeholders has not been a problem line manage management in the beginning but um with time when we show value uh, that resistance just disappears okay. mm -hmm. um that that's our experience mm -hmm. brilliant I also think that uh, I think Timo and, and Frederick, what you are saying is the key, right? Like when you are able to show the value, then everything will change over time. I think we, uh, and when I say we, I don't necessarily mean the people who are very good at this performance side of things, but more like generic in uh, generally like people in L and D. I think we are quite guilty sometimes that we talk too much about learning with our stakeholders and that makes it very hard mm -hmm. to break through their assistance because we are not talking about the things that actually matter to them. Mm -hmm. So I think just a uh, you know just something for people to think about I think like are we actually trying to understand what the people we are working with tr are trying to achieve what's important to them like do we need to change our language do we need to change our focus and so forth. So I think that's key what you both uh, explained. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. I, 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 go on. Sorry, Carl. No, I was just going to say the issue of time is a very interesting one. And it goes back to the thing about what are what's the job of managers and supervisors. And yeah. I, one of my largest longtime clients, a big biotech firm, they used to have a, a kind of a program that they call purposeful presence on the floor. And it was kind of the 21st century version of managing by walking around. They did not want their managers to be sitting in their offices looking at spreadsheets all the time. They wanted to be out working with people, observing, seeing what they need and so forth. And, and another relevant thing is we were, I remember I was uh, training some ma managers some years ago. We had a director level guy in an IT department. And he said, I expect the people that work for me to be spending about 10% of their time helping to develop and coach their people. And if they can't find the time, they should come to me and we'll readjust their priorities. But this is very important. You got to drive that down through the organization so people understand that's part of their job and we'll make time for it, you know? Yeah. And, and one, one more funny thing, because it, it's uh, it, like... Uh, there's no resistance uh, with example my, my stakeholders but i just had my end year review with uh, with my most important sorry everyone else who is listening in but i have one most important right so uh, we had the end year review and she said like uh, you, you you guys are doing so much valuable stuff and helping us out that's great but temo um you know I love the, the the things we did before also. So if you would say that we will go back, we will go back. I said, we're never <laughs> looking back again. We're just going forward. So you have to keep pushing it because they understand the value now, but they like the old things. It's yeah. inspirational. Well, I'm going to raise a question. How many supervisors were actually told? Where does it say that your job is to develop your team, grow, grow the business, you know, I, I don't think they that that's like that's an that's other duties as assigned. Yeah, that's not a key part of their role, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that uh, HR can take some responsibility for help reframing what is that role of the mm -hmm. first line, middle line, mids, you know, and, and it really is developing the people, getting yeah. rid of barriers. 
And some people who yeah. get who get promoted into those roles, that's the last thing they want to do. It's like oh, yeah. salespeople who become sales managers. They don't want to help their people. They want to close the deal themselves. That's what they like right. doing. Right. Engineers, they want to be the smartest guy in the room. It's like, wait a minute, that's not actually your job now, you know? Well, then the problem is compensation because the only way that people can get higher compensation is to move them into a supervisory role. Mm -hmm. And some people should never, ever be in that role. You should mm -hmm. keep them in the closet, let them do their thing, <laughs> wonderful, right. give them lots of money. Like Frederick. <laughs> keep them in a the closet. Yeah, I was thinking the exactly. same thing. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> we... we but I, compensation has built up models that really run counter to what we're interested in. Yeah. So we, know, I, yeah. I, I've actually had managers. Well, one of my interesting jobs was I was told, Judy, we're going to be raided by the FBI. I said, what's wrong? Because workers were bringing, you know, they had coding. They had everything else on their desk. They were acting out. And their boss, they, who was wonderful, wonderful at his job, but could not coach anybody. You didn't even want him to have a dog or a cat. He couldn't do that, okay? Mm -hmm. And and people were very disappointed. But compensation, he said he's so valuable, the only way we can pay him is to make him director mm -hmm. and manager. He had no interest, no skills, mm -hmm. you know, no, mm -hmm. no. So I think about compensation's role here. Yep. You, you know, I, I, when I was working with Microsoft, this is a few years ago now, early 2000s, but they had that challenge, which is that engineering uh, engineers wanted to become managers to make more money. So they eventually created career paths that went all the way up to Microsoft Fellow. You could be a sole you know, individual contributor, make a great contribution, but stay away from management because you're not the person for that. So I think I, my late business partner, the Ray Svensson, created a technical track to go along with the management track at Alcoa back in 1984. So that's a very real issue here is there are people who shouldn't go into management because that's not their thing, but they go there for the money and the prestige and creating those dual tracks can help. And I think that we can help our clients figure out, well, what does that mean to move up the technical ladder, so to speak? Because that's what their trouble, their structure, they didn't have a structure in place. They didn't know whether right. somebody should be at the level one, two, three, four, or five, or, or whatever. But that just can be clearly defined by taking that performance orientation to things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guy, we've got some questions, uh, I think, that have come in um, that, that, uh, that um, would like to put to, to uh, members of the panel? Yes, and I, Carl has already answered this, but I'm going to ask Carl to do it so that it's on the video here. But uh, uh, Jean Jeanette from the Philippines is asking, where should L&D start if it needs to make the company a learning organization as one of the goals of the senior leadership team? Mm -hmm. So, Carl, can you go first? Well, well, my my approach is always to try to turn people on to an accomplishment-based approach, and that is a huge turning the Queen Mary, because most people don't really understand what that means. But if, for example, we sometimes do executive coaching, and one of the things we do is we identify the outputs or the accomplishments of the executive, and they start to see what that would look like to define their job. And then if you train managers and supervisors to, to do that with their folks, you say, this is what you need to be able to produce successfully. And it may be widgets, but it may be decisions or relationships or trans it's a lot of outputs. But just starting with that as a thing which becomes how we do things around here, I think then naturally will drive a learning organization because that's what we want to do. We want to become more productive. And so let's focus everybody on that. That's that's one way to think about it, at least. Anybody else want to, want to address that as well? Well, I think Carl said it, you know, really very well. First of all, you start with whoever's going to talk to you. Yeah. I mean, really, if you can't say, I can't start until the executives come in. Well, you start with where you start. That's right. And and you change the conversation. Mm -hmm. You reframe the conversation. You're talking about what are we really trying to accomplish, what that means. And it's not a performance improvement like you're deficient. I'm here. No. But it's really about bringing light to what we assume and what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when, when you start there, then it will go out yep. from there. Yeah, by example. So you can create a learning function or a learning department, start there and model that, and maybe the rest of the organization might embrace the whole uh, notion. Um, there's a couple of converse, uh, comments here. We're still trying to put Band-Aids on many of the problems and challenges without learning 
uh, how to be the solution or the right answer. This is a consequence of not looking at performance and output as the starting point. So I think this resonates with you know what Carl, Judy, and others have said here is that we really need to look at at performance, and we need to help our our clients begin to look at performance and learning as a means to that ends. Because I think if they come to us asking for learning products, we just need to flip the conversation. I've done that by saying, okay, I, I've heard you. I've done my active listening with your request. What would practice with feedback look like that's authentic to the learners? Mm -hmm. And that's where we can try to get away from one size fits all because they right. might say, well, everybody's application of something would be very different. We have to lead them there and help them see that that will be more effective than the generic approach that perhaps they're used to seeing from us. Mm -hmm. I have a question because that to me, like it signals two things. You need certain capabilities, right? Like you, that you have guy as a consultant, but I think it also requires a certain structure in an organization. Mm -hmm. um, so can we, I don't know if that will be helpful for people, but maybe not the capabilities things. Yeah. That's quite, I think, easy or not easy, but clear to see that that's required. But how about like what does it take in in a bigger organization? How should, would you structure that? What is in talent? What is you know? This is usually it's like talent does like the whole you know planning for like hiring and um, the buy borrow uh, build kind of thing, and then you have and then and, and quickly it goes to learning if they think if somebody thinks there's a learning need. But where do these conversations happen? I think that is one of the trickier parts here. And when I met the, the late Ray Svensson, when I was at Motorola, he was helping to formalize what he called the governance and advisory system that engaged this, the key stakeholders, the key leaders to make the business decisions about where to make investments. So it kind of percolated up in terms of what were the needs. And that went through a series of committees to get to the very top where they would see what well, here's this need and here's the price tag to address it. Um, and they would make those business decisions consistent with what uh, the late Gary Rummler called critical business issues. So what were the critical business issues and how can we begin to align resources to help people learn how to do those things? And in our analysis efforts, we would uncover, you know, there were other gaps, you know, maybe data and information systems weren't adequately addressing something. So it's more than just people being trained or learning how to do something. It's the whole infrastructure, the environment that, in that context that needs to be addressed. So I think that one of the things that I think that I learned from him was that engage more formally with your leadership so that you're working on things that are important to them. And that I think gives you license to bring up all the things necessary to begin to address those problems and or opportunities. Mm -hmm. There's there's another thing as you were speaking, I was reminded of, which is at the other end of the spectrum. I don't know where everybody in this group, how they think about it, but I think competency modeling is the most damaging thing that's ever been done to training, development, performance improvement or anything, because it's a level of abstraction that everybody thinks they're doing something with. Oh, you're a four or five on strategic thinking. It means absolutely nothing. It's completely subjective. It doesn't specify what people need to learn or know, let alone what they need to be. You know, communication capability looks different in a negotiation with a client versus a one-to-one -one with a direct report. So the reason I mention that is being accomplishment-based in the lineage of, of Gilbert and, and uh, Harless, I think the entire talent development process can be accomplishment-based. We hire people based on what they've produced in the past or their experience with it. We build, we build things like behavioral uh, que you know, interviewing questions or performance tests. We then train people based on the and, and onboard them based on the outputs they need to produce in the job. We we then have specific training about that with where outputs are the or accomplishments are the objectives. You know, we then get to an ongoing coaching process that is all about accomplishments. You can drive all of talent development with an accomplishment base as opposed to a competency based. But unfortunately, companies have invested literally billions of dollars in their learning management systems and their performance management systems where you rate people on competencies and waste a lot of time and money. So that's my rant, you know. I'm just going to make the noise to, for, I don't know if you guys can hear this, but. Um, that's it. And that's what skills are today. Skills are yesterday's competencies. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Tia, do you want to um, finish off with your 
Yeah, I, I just to chip in because because uh, I, I think that uh, uh, when I talk to people, it, it, it seems like people feel like all of this is like this big move. But if you look at Frederick's journey, for example, when we started off three and a half years ago, we, we had basically two stakeholders and we we were digging where we stand. And for every time we create value, someone else comes in and say, can you do that for us? Of course but we need resources and then we get resources. And then we have this community where we set these common methodologies, common technologies, common everything. So we get people to do the same thing as we do. And with time, we became bigger and bigger. And now Frederick is the head of yeah. learning at Delia, which is crazy. <laughs> and that's just because we started to yeah. dig where we stand. Not because you're not great, because you are, but but that's that's one way of starting it. Just do the work. True. Yeah. Again, do the work, do the do the right work. Yeah. Talk to the people who will talk yeah, yeah. to you. Start there. Mm -hmm. To talk the language that they understand, the issues that they want. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a wonderful way to uh, to wrap it up. Respectful of uh, of people's time as we uh, as we as we hit the hour mark. Um, this has been uh, uh, a wonderful conversation, uh, as rich and as useful as uh, as as certainly I anticipated. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Judy, Carl, Tiemu, Miriam, and Frederick. Uh, this has been a uh, hugely interesting and valuable conversation. And thank you, thank you, Guy, again for uh, for another series. Of, uh, of LED's Pivot to Performance. It's been a pleasure uh, doing this with you uh, again. And thank you uh, for joining us today and for everybody who's joined us uh, over the last 10 weeks, the last five sessions. Um, you will, everybody who signed up will get a copy of the, uh, of the recording. So, uh, so in the season of goodwill, be very generous with sharing that with peers, colleagues, friends and family. Uh, I'm sure they'll all be very appreciative. Uh, we'll also ensure that uh, the recordings uh, hit uh, your channels in other ways. I know that there'll be episodes of the, uh, of the Learning and Development podcast. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody, again. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, getting to know you and your stories of, over the last few weeks. Uh, an absolute pleasure. Thank you again for, uh, for being involved in this series. So uh, thank, you. So thank you very much. Thanks Bye. so much for having me and being part of this. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's great fun. Thank you. Thank you.